So thank you everybody for being here today. For the Love of Art is an interview series hosted by Michael Ginsberg, Ginsberg sorry, the co-founder of Legion Paper. The series invites artisans from all corners of the fine art world to learn about their craft, the importance of paper, and essentially what makes them tick. <coughs> My name is Mark Shotland, and I'll be your moderator. Michael Ginsberg began his paper career in 1964 in the sample department of Crestwood Paper. In the 70s, Michael concentrated his efforts to expand the availability of fine art papers in the United States by introducing new papers from around the world, which are considered landmark brands to this day, such as Somerset, Stonehenge, and Coventry Rag. In 1994, Michael, with partner Len Levine, formed Legion Paper with the objective to become the largest importer and distributor of fine art papers in North America. Michael continues to source and create new papers for an ever-changing market, and also find time to host his show. Today, we're going to meet Paul Vogel, founder of Vogel Bindery. Paul began his craft over 40 years ago, apprenticing mm -hmm. in England before coming back to the United States to open his own bookbinding studio. As a master binder and restorer, Paul's craft is unique and labor-intensive, working with tools and materials that haven't changed in over a thousand mm -hmm. years. Paul creates handcrafted masterpieces that sit on shelves of some of our most respected institutions. Paul will pull back the curtain for a rare peek behind the scenes, showing us his process and taking your questions. So Michael, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Um, just a brief uh, intro uh, in addition to what Mark just said. <clears throat> when I started in the, uh, in the paper industry in 1965, 1966, selling uh, commercial paper to offset printers um, <clears throat> that printed travel brochures or they printed uh, annual reports. Um, the word binder or bindery had a whole other meaning to me. Um, <clears throat> uh, what you're going to witness in the uh, next hour um, is going to be incredible. Uh, <clears throat> what an offset printer did, by the way, uh, after the job was printed, um, he would send the uh, the job uh, on a pallet, uh, <clears throat> printed flat sheets uh, to be cut. They were folded and they were stitched, usually on an automatic piece of equipment. Um, today, you're going to see uh, what gives the term bindery an entirely different meaning. Um, and who, all, and who Paul Vogel is to bind me, uh, Vogel bind me without question, a totally different, different meaning. What Paul does in his studio is not just binding a book or an album. Uh, it is producing a work of art. And the craftsmanship you'll see in the next hour is pure creativity in its finest form. <clears throat> and the reason I asked Paul to be part of this series for the love of art is exactly what Paul does in his studio. So without wasting any more time, because we got a, a lot to push across the table, let's say hello to my friend, Paul Vogel. How are you, Paul? I'm good, Michael. Thanks for having me on this. My pleasure. So uh, a little bit background. So uh, I, I'm looking at what's behind you. Oh, my God, <clears throat> it's an arsenal. How did you get started in, in this industry? How, how did you say, you know what, I want to become a fine art bookbinder? Um, I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and I studied graphics, which is book design. And that was more designing fonts, page layout. It was more getting a book ready so it could go into production for mass printing. And part of the course <clears throat> was to go to Columbia University Rare Book School and we bound a book by hand. And um, after I graduated, I went overseas and traveled for six years. Wow. At the end of that <clears throat> journey, I was in London thinking about what am I going to do for a career? And I remembered how much I liked binding that book, that one course that I took. Uh, so I followed up on it in Britain where book binding is not such an unusual occupation. And uh, I met up with a fellow who was a, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a very noted bookbinder, and spent the day with him in his bindery just to see how things, you know, transpired. And uh, by the end of the day, I realized that it uh, fit all of my criteria for what I wanted out of a career. I could be my own boss. 
uh, I'd be part of a long tradition that actually goes back, a craft that goes back uh, 1700 years. It's a valuable service because you're preserving the printed word. Um, and uh, the, just the environment in a book bindery is very mm -hmm. artistic and historic. I like that, a bit of a romantic in that sense. Um, so it, uh, and it also allowed me to meet a, a full range of people, whether they're in, uh, you know, politicians, economists, in, you know, in religion, military, you know, so it was, it was great to just see a cross section of society mm -hmm. at some point <clears throat> they'd come across the, uh, the doorway and to, to get something done. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I've been doing it now for, uh, over 35 years. And it's, yeah, and you know, Paul, it, it makes it very special because what you do is not too dissimilar to what I was saying in the intro is you are creating by hand, literally a work of art. Uh, yeah, you can make it as creative as you want because the basic binding, if I could describe it this way, would be like stretching a canvas. And that's the leather going over the cover. Mm, You've got right. a solid book. And uh, thank you, Hadley. And then <clears throat> once you have a book bound, what you do to the cover, uh, then you can be as creative as, as you'd like. Uh, if I could have that album too. So we had a baby album. And um, we decided to put on moon and stars just to make it a bit more interesting. This one's not as elaborate as they can get, as you'll see later. Or just to do relief. Wow, wow. And, um, now, now, on that particular, is how is that is in, in, embossed or debossed? No, what we do is on the cover board, <clears throat> we, we have these le letters uh, carved. And they were made out of wood and they're laid on the cover board before you put the leather on. So oh, the leather it. is stretched and then laid over in detail mm. and then it dries this way. So it's wow. unbelievable. That, that's, that's the magic behind that one. And uh, we've used materials that range from rubber, glass, metals, um, computer parts, anything. So as I say, you can be as creative as you can be. Not everybody wants that. <clears throat> a lot of people want a very functional, straightforward uh, binding, but there are clients who like something more whimsical. Yeah. Now, what's going on behind you is really like, you know, I mean, it, <clears throat> so many tools, so many, I mean, I mean, rolls of, of material. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, over here, these <laughs> are the leathers that we use. And there's uh, two basic types of leather we use. One is the calf skin, and the other one is goat skin. And I'll take this down the... <clears throat> now, you and I talked about this before, Paul. I mean, there's nothing synthetic there. I mean, it's all, it's, it's really the real deal. Uh, yeah, these are hand tanned in Britain. And uh, this is the calf skin, which is smooth. And it's made in uh, Edinburgh in Scotland. And this is the goat skin, which has a sort of a grain to it, some more than others. And this is made in Northamptonshire, England. Um, they're both vegetable tanned, which uses a process using uh, sumac. And uh, it's one of the tanning processes. But mm -hmm. for uh, book binding, you want to use vegetable tanning. <clears throat> sumac, they find, is the best because it's light, fast, and it makes the leather supple and it's very long lasting. You can use other things, but they're for different purposes like chrome tan. Most clothing is made out of chrome tan. Oh, really? Yeah. Which if you were to see the leather, some of them looks look exactly like a book binding leather, but the, but the difference being is over the years, one will uh, decay and the other one won't. Right, do you get most of your leathers, I guess, from the, from the U UK? I mean, basically. Yeah, I would say everybody, gets them from the UK. Now the Germans are sending over some stuff. The French, um, a little bit, they're very sort of, be, they, they begrudgingly let up their leather. Um, so it's mostly Britain, at least for America. And Americans don't seem to have a, uh, a vegetable tanning industry. So you have to buy overseas. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can show you some other leathers that we use. <clears throat> this one over here, it's not actually a leather, It's it's 
process differently. This is vellum. And you can hear it. It looks like a parchment. Very oh, well. stiff. Like a parchment. Parchment. Now vellum, it's you can use them interchangeably, but vellum is really uh, from veal or lamb, and parchment oh. could be from any other animal. Right. This, right. this is tanned with uh, <clears throat> with alum or al aluminum salts. And it's very long lasting, but they call it a volatile material, which means if it gets any moisture on it, it'll just go crazy. It tries to throw it off small. It was stretched out on a wooden frame and pegged out. <clears throat> and then they thin it out to as thin as they need it for whatever purpose they're using it and, and dries. But it's always trying to get back to this size. So well, it's very, it seems very brittle. Is it, is it with that snap? It won't you know? break but it's difficult to work with. And if you make a book out of it, you need to use wood cover boards because it will just bend everything else when right. it reacts with the humidity in the summer. And it's got a lot of memory, obviously, too. Oh, yeah. And its memory yeah. is to get back to this big. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then we use other leathers, like uh, this is a uh, <laughs> lambskin that's been plated in silver. Wow. And we use, um, we have, oh, this one's interesting. Chagrin. Or stingray. Oh. It always has that distinctive little kernel in the center. And it's a bit like little glass beads. Wow. And uh, this is very difficult to work with. The French use it, but they tend to laminate it onto the sides of boxes and things because you really can't cut it. It sort of ruins your scissors. How about, uh, Paul, how about snake skins? Do you, do you... you use snake? Problem is, <clears throat> they're only about this wide. Yeah. So it has to be a small book or a spine on a book. We use alligator, crocodile. I have deer skin here, which is uh, like glove leather. And uh, But it's stained. So you get the oil on it, it turns black. Really? Wow. And we also use uh, things like, um, uh, you know, they're, they're any type of an exotic skin. Let me, could you um, get that book from the... Uh, office that has the chicken legs on it. Do you know which one that is? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> we even have a book here that Hadley is getting, which is made out of these little plaquettes that are this big and sewn together. And it's the leg of a chicken that they unwrapped and tanned and sewed them together. Really? Like an incredible amount of, uh, of uh, sort of work goes into it. I haven't seen it. I bought this probably about 30 years ago and I thought it was fascinating. And that was the last I saw it. Well, here we are. Thanks, Hadley. So the leathers can be, can you see that? Yeah, wow. <laughs> and if I had rice paper, then it would be chicken and rice. <laughs> so now, well, leathers are so many types, even we have. So them. now, uh, what's, <clears throat> what's going on to your left on that back wall? I mean, with all of those, oh, the surgical, all those surgical tools that you have there. Yeah, these are <clears throat> these are called decorative decorative rolls, and um, the design is on the edge, and they get heated up on a on a hot plate, and uh, you lay the gold down, and you roll this through the gold into the leather, and it transfers the design. Wow! Oh. And uh, so. It works on heat, and we also, I'm gonna bring this over. Um, we also have hand tools, which are the same principle, and those are to put right. sort of little spot decorations either on the spine or the cover board. Same process, heat them up, tools through the gold, and then clean that off. Yeah. Uh, over here now, we have the cloth. And you can see it's quite a range. Um, for the most part, these cloths are cotton linen. Mm -hmm. It's a cloth called iris. Uh, it's very good for book binding. And a book binding cloth is good in that it's back. So when you cut the edge of it, it doesn't fray. We can use other cloths. And some of them need a lot more work just to make sure the fraying is in control. But we use morays and uh, burlaps and whatever. But for the most part, it's the iris because it has a nice range of uh, colors. Right, well. right. Wow. So um, that's pretty much it for the for the uh, cloth and leather. And then we go on to the paper. Oh, you get into the guts of the book. Yeah. 
Yeah, we start off with that. And uh, <clears throat> paper that we make a lot of albums more than any other type of binding. And we always use Stonehenge. And uh, it works really well because it's stiff enough that it can hold up to mounting photos on it. And, um, and it's also supple enough that you can turn the pages. Right. 100% cotton, and so it's soft, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We, but the thing is with our book binding is that <clears throat> we want to make sure everything is archival. So the linen that we sew it with is Irish or French, 100% pure linen. Um, the paper is 100% cotton rag. Uh, leathers are archival. The glues are archival. Everything that we can put into it. Now, the glues you use are... Uh... When you say they're archive, are they animal-based uh, glu uh, adhesives or, or glues? Uh, that's not used as much these days. Now it's more of a polymer-based glue, which looks like Elmer's glue. Uh, could you get me right. a little bit of that? And it's a white glue and uh, <clears throat> it's starch, a polymer -based. Possibly starch as well. Yeah. And we also can mix it with other things like wheat paste for other purposes right. and, and uh, methyl cellulose. And <clears throat> uh, the thing is, it, it's acid-free and it can be reversed too so people like that for historical sort of mm. restorations that you can actually take it away without damaging the book um, Got it. and um i can show you now that what we're going to do with a uh, the first step in putting one of these albums together the process is really important without a doubt so here we have a piece of bamboo which uh just came in the other day thank you michael you're welcome and uh, this is it full size, and it gets folded. I need a, there we go. By the way, this, this bamboo, Paul, just so you know, <clears throat> is his, it does have about a 10% uh, composition of cotton in it. Right. Yeah. Bamboo is a very, very hard fiber, and the cotton helps soften it up a little bit. And it's echo friendly, which I like. Yeah. Now I wouldn't do it on the table. It's just that it's easier for the uh, for the camera shot. So it's folded, and when it's folded, it's folded with the grain. Right. Very important because if I didn't do that, then. Um, when I make the book, the pages wouldn't turn easily because um, the grain would make, if it's against the grain, it would be very stiff. Yeah, you're fighting it. Very yeah. unpleasant experience right. turning those pages. So then you cut them down to size. They next go over here to this little contraption, which, you take the page and you put this on top and it has the holes already marked off so you can make sure that they go in precisely the same place for each signature. Got it, wow. And then they go over to Handley. And she's over here, and she is going to sew the last signature. And it's on a sewing frame here, and she's using a, uh, this is a 15, number 15 linen thread. And you try to gauge the thread to be um, as thick as you need for that particular job. So a very thick paper would need a heavier gauge thread. Thinner pages, you want to use a thinner. <clears throat> And so <clears throat> that's how you sew it on these, on these, they call them tapes. And when it's done, it'll look like that. Wow, yeah. And the next step is to go over here, which is the backing press. It's like a big vise on its side. And you put it with the spine side up, you use your hammer, and you, with a glancing blow, you draw the folds in the paper over towards you on one side and away from you on the other side. So when you're done, it has that round that you'll see in the back 
Wow. Books. And so this book is now backed. And then the next step would be to, you know, to sort of solidify the back. You put on a paper and you glue that on the, on the spine of the book to make it a bit more solid so it doesn't jostle. The next step after that would be to cut the cover boards. And again, they'd be done on this <clears throat> machine over here. And I'll now, what do you use? What do you use as cover boards, uh, Paul? Uh, the cover board material, it's, they call it a binder's board. Um, right. It's, uh, again, you can buy it acid free. And um, you, you really can't, you can buy it acid free because my, my thinking of a binder's board has always been industrial, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, recently, well, I shouldn't say recently, probably in the last 10 years, uh, there's been enough. Uh, request for it that they've been making acid-free binders board. I don't know how acid-free, but it's better than it used to be. Right. Two of those boards from... Uh, and you can get it in a variety of thicknesses, obviously. Yes. And so what I've done to make it even more acid-free is that that's a core of binders board in here, and it's laminated on both sides with Stonehenge. So that goes... <laughs> onto the book and you see you want to make sure that the thickness of the board matches the this this little area that's raised that's right open. right right and then now you have your cover boards cut for the book thank you and you know it, i was wondering paul if it was if there was ever cons I, I don't think it would be that rigid because industrial binders board is very, very stiff and very rigid. And I'm thinking that, you know, museum board, you know, like a rising museum board, which comes in like 120 point, you know, could be a good backing board. But, you know, because it's cotton fiber, it might be a little bit too soft. Yeah, that's one of the problems is uh, you want a, um, a good hard board because when, uh, A, it protects the book a lot better but it's better to tool on a harder right. surface, right. a spongy surface. Right. And then the next, so um, after that, we would wrap the leather on the cover and then we could begin tooling. And I could show you uh, a little bit of the tooling that we do. This is like very perfunctory because Okay, so over here. Now, this is called tooling. Yeah. And uh, in Britain, they call it forwarding. And they and, and some of their bindaries, um, the different steps are broken up to different stations. So somebody might only do the, uh, the gold tooling. Somebody else might only sew. But uh, in America, most bindaries are way too small. Plus, I think it would be way too boring just to do one thing. So I'm heating the decorative roll up now. And I've got, in this case, I've used a, a, a gold that's backed onto a mylar and I'm going to tool it on to this. And that, that's going to take a second. But while that's happening, I can show you mm -hmm. another part of getting the, the cover ready. The, when you turn the leather over the cover board, you want the edge of it to be thinned out so it blends into the other, to, you know, the turn in on the other side. Mm -hmm. We take our side mm -hmm. and you're just taking a little bit off the edge. And you do this all the way around. Wow. And uh, you now would have. It's very, very thin along the edge so that when you turn it over, it blends in. And um, this here is a litho stone. It's a great surface to skive on because it's a bit forgiving. Glass is a little too hard and you can dull your blade. This is a French paring knife, which is rounded. Right. As right. opposed to the English. which is on an wow. angle like this. So let's see how we're doing here. That seems good. Maybe just 
just a bit more. Um, <clears throat> You've got to heat it up so that you get the right sizzle and you have your pad of a wad of cotton that's soaked in water. And if it's too hot, it will burn it. And if it's too light, it really won't tool well. As that's heating up, do you have time for a couple questions? Sure. Um, first one is how much preparation of leather do you have to do prior to being ready to glue onto a, bo onto a book? And tied into that is how do you keep the glue from getting everywhere when you're gluing? Oh, um, as far as prepping the leather, uh, well, the first thing you need to do is to get the best yield you can out of a skin because they're very expensive. And, um, and you, uh, once you've got your piece cut, you can, if you're gonna be doing intensive tooling on the back, to soak the back in a, uh, uh, it's a mixture of, um, sort of wheat paste, methyl cellulose, and um, that's this is what I use. And some of the glue, and it will harden the leather so that it will be able to take the tooling more easily, or more crisp, crisply, I should say. This still needs a little bit more time. And um, the other question was? A question was about the glue. How do you keep it from, um, from going everywhere? everywhere? Yeah, um, it, it's just practice, I think. Very often in the beginning, you might think, oh, the more glue, the you know, the better it's going to stick. But uh, that's not necessarily the case. And sometimes it totally works against you because it'll just come uh, squeegeeing out the sides and everything's a mess. And it's not really adhering because it's just it's too wet, the bond. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a matter of knowing how much to put on for each step. OK, I would, uh, Paul, I would imagine that, you know, that that said this. There's got to be some curating involved as well, yes? Um, and what, what do you mean by that exactly? Uh, curating in terms of excess, uh, you know, it gets onto a you know, part of the book that you don't want it to be there or, you know, I mean. Yeah, right. Now, you've, you've got to be very careful on that, yeah. on that score. And here is the... Uh, <clears throat> wow. And that's using this design here. So it's just a matter of transferring through the gold onto your surface. So I can turn that off. Mm. Uh, how many, Paul, how many different embossments roll? I mean, that tool, You might, how many do you have? I mean, I, I, you know, it could be endless, yes? Yes, yeah. You know, you can go on um, eBay and look to see uh, who's closing their bindery or who's simply selling hand tools or decorative rolls. Is that what it's called a decorative roll? Is what yeah, they, you know, it's, if it has a design on the edge like this, it's a decorative roll. And if it's straight line, then it's called a fillet. Though it's, it's spelled F-I-L-E-T, but the English say fillet, not fillet. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a combination of both. And um, strangely enough, I don't, you know, the fancy, I used to buy a lot of very fancy ones in the beginning, very Victorian. But that's not a popular design. So I have lots of hand tools and decorative rolls that are too fussy for most people. They want something a bit simpler or funkier. You know, I've got one that looks, that looks a bit like barbed wire. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, so I've, I've changed the types of, uh, of tools that I buy now. Did you ever create your own design? Um, I have on occasion, yeah. I've sketched yeah. things up and I've had somebody make them. I did one for a, uh, uh, here, here's something, thanks, Hats. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see that, is that good? Uh, I sketched these uh, flowers. They were taken from a bouquet that was in a wedding. And there's four different types. And, um, and tool those, tool, this is, this is uh, vellum and this is calfskin and then colored in some of the interior. And this wow. sun was taken from uh, an illustration and I sent them the black and white drawing at the, the dye maker. And oh. then they just turned that into a brass dye. Wow. Well, this over here is a uh, table setting. So you uh, put your cards, you slide them underneath and show where you're gonna be sitting on this, at this particular really? table. We do a lot of things for, uh, people who entertain a lot. And one of them is table settings, very popular. Got it. Um, 
<clears throat> now you've done you've done some work for some you know notable people, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, that's because as I say, bookbinding allows you to interact with people from <clears throat> all different occupations, all levels of society. And what I found so good about bookbinding is people who aren't necessarily engaging or warm uh, or nice tend to be <laughs> on their best behavior when they're with you because I don't think they need to feel like they have to prove anything. You know, if I was somebody in a business that they or sport that they feel like they should know about, you know, they might get you know a little bit um, get their hackles up and thinking they have to prove themselves. But with a bookbinder, it's sort of like you tell me everything. You know, I'm not supposed to know anything about this, so uh, I'm here to learn. And uh, I've had a couple of instances where people would I would say, oh, I just did a job for so and so, and they'd say, oh God, he's horrible, isn't he? And I said, no, he's the nicest person. <laughs> but I'm not denying what my friend said, but I see them on their best behavior for the most part. Yeah. 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 Wow. Now, do they leave it, you know, when they come to you, Paul, do they, what, 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 whoever it might be, do they, they have an idea in mind or do they, they basically lean to your expertise for design? For the most part, they'll say, um, let's say, I'm making an album for my daughter or niece. You know, it's a wedding album and she's very funky. So can you do something that's with that, you know, with a design with that in mind. And I'll, I, at Pratt, I also studied drawing. Right. So I get to use my drawing skills. I don't do things on computer. I actually sketch them and uh, send them a picture of the sketch and some related photos of other bindings that had some of those elements in it. And we go back and forth on it until we get the design nailed down. So for the most part, they'll give me a general direction, which way they want to go. And right. then I take it from there. Right. And, or they could even see a picture in a magazine and cut it out and say, oh, I want this, and I could do that. So uh, I think it's, it's I find it best if they give me um, the ability to design as I'm going along. Because sometimes in the middle of a design, you realize it would actually would be better if we did such and such, made a little bit of a change here, and I've got the freedom to do it rather than being sort of nailed down to a set design that can't be changed. Mm. Some, you know, sometimes that's fine, and other times you wish you could tweak it a bit as you're going along. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple of questions about the gold leaf. Uh, are there different types of gold leafs that you use, and is it necessary to seal it after using the gold leaf? Um, no, we don't seal it. <clears throat> there was a, uh, a period where people were putting a varnish on their books after they were done to give them that very shiny look, but uh, I felt it looked less leathery at that point. And I really don't see that very much anymore. They used to do that a lot with the Asprey books. Um, <clears throat> for the gold, we have uh, gold, actual gold leaf, which comes in little squares about this big. Um, I didn't use it today because uh, it's so diaphanous that if somebody was to sneeze on the other side of the room, it would just blow away. Really? Wow. It's many times thinner than a human hair, like a thousand times thinner than a human hair. So you could take a whole leaf rub it in your hand and there would be nothing left by the time you're done. Um, so that's one type of gold leaf and that comes in different colors because you have some that are more rose, some that are more orange and it depends the look you're after. And it's the same with the gold that I just use now. It comes in a more bronze and a more yellow or they call it a lemon. Um, so you, you do have a, a choice there as well. And some bindings are better with uh, one look or one gold than another. And they also have um, different colored foils as well as you can do tool and silver. You know, you can do blind tooling, which is no foil or <laughs> gold at all. And it's just a debossing into the leather, which is a nice effect. You, you, Paul, you, you, you're kind of like, I'm not gonna say the best kept secret, but you kind of, <clears throat> here you are tucked away uh, you're not even a mile from where I am, you know, in terms of living. Um, how, how do how do most people find you? I mean, I know you don't advertise. Um, you um, is is it word of mouth? I mean, recommendation and yes, you know, I was I started off in the city. I was on uh, 150 West 26th Street. <clears throat> Built up my clientele there for the first ten years, <clears throat> and then moved out here. Um, so. 
it was a bit of a gamble, but my clients followed me out here. And a lot of them actually have second homes and I got to see more of them. Right, right. They weren't busy. They were on vacation. And uh, sure, I could stop by and see the binder and talk about a binding. <clears throat> and you couldn't get that FaceTime while you were in the city. It's also a little bit of a town of celebrity, too. I mean, you know, given where we are. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and it's word of mouth. Because right. I've been through experiences with uh, trying to sort of beat the bushes and drum up more business. Uh, when I was doing that, I would go out and make these cold calls or speak to people who I thought might be interested. And um, I couldn't give them a book. You know, they'd say, wow. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, I wouldn't hear from them. And uh, maybe months or years later, um, I'd get a phone call from the same person saying, yeah, I was over at so-and-so's house, some big mucky muck, and they had one of your books on the table, and I think you're just great, and whatever you do is perfect. And I thought you're the person who wouldn't give me the time of day before, but then somebody they looked up to had it, and I was golden, and then yeah. they would refer me. So uh, it's one of those things where I don't think I could really sell it because they need to hear it from somebody else. And I right, was right. Like, I've got enough momentum that that's that's the case. <clears throat> you got to call Paul Vogel if you want that done, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Now, Paul, what was the most difficult job that you had to do? I mean, you have, you have. Let's see. Um, we did have. I don't know. If, I'd say the biggest. We could start off there. Yeah. I had a client who, for his uh, birthday, I think it was his sixtieth birthday, um, we did a thousand. Handbound books, all different titles, and all the wow. they were categories in different colors. Some of them were on science, others were in American literature, and whatever. There were probably about twelve different categories, and uh, they were uh, fully gilded. You know, the text block was gilded. That's where you put the gold right. around the edge of the book block, as right. well as a lot of tooling on it. Oh, and that took a couple of years. Um, <clears throat> that that project took a couple of years to do. Yeah, there were a thousand plus. I had to be sort of fulfilling other orders as well. So it wasn't wow. just that one, you know, order that I had to work on. Wow. So that was a ton of work. And um, so I'd say some of the most difficult things I had to do were um, uh, they're one of a kind. They would be desk accessories that had to have flaps that did certain things. And you had to reinvent the wheel to see how that was going to work because it might work up to a certain point near the end, and then you realize that it wouldn't close fully. Right. You gotta go back to the beginning, open it up, change it a bit, and you find yourself doing it maybe two, possibly three times before everything clicked in at the very end. Now, do you use any special closures at all? I mean, the intricate closures or? or... Um, yeah, yeah, um, not that often, but <clears throat> we use magnets. Which are kind of fun, mm. and um, we use a leather barbed wire. You'll see it in uh, the slide that will show some of the book mm. files that I now have. We do have, we do uh, to that point, Paul. We do, Mark, I think, has or you have some slides that you've sent to me. There were some incredible projects that you that you did. Yeah, if we put that up, then I could kind of explain what went into some of them, Mark. I'll you can. I'll put that up right now. As I'm putting that up, a couple of questions just on, can you give uh, us a sense of what costs somebody can uh, expect on the low end to the high end of a book? Yeah, I can get a very simple leather book uh, for about 500 and the price can go up to whatever if they want to have all the bells and whistles on it. And if it's oversized, um, different types of materials they want to use, an exotic skin. So that would, that would dramatically alter the price. Now, what I have up here, thank you, Mark, <clears throat> is a brief history of uh, what I called handheld, bear with me, handheld information recording implements. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> uh, you'll be able to record information and bring it from one village to another rather than just carving it on a, you know, a tree or on a, in a, inside a cave where you wouldn't be able to transport it. And <clears throat> the one at the top left is a bone that goes back uh, 38,000 years BC. Wow. And, uh, they believe that those markings, they feel um, 
track the lunar progression. And, um, and you know, they're bones, so they're obviously easily transported. And then if you go up to the top right and you have cuneiform, which is a, a lump of clay about the size of a baseball or smaller, and uh, they would prod into it while it was wet with a stylus. And the information that they could record was uh, was very sophisticated. You not only could say, you know, I sold 60 barrels of oil, but you could talk about your king who won this wonderful oh. battle against so-and-so in a certain year. So you could tell a story rather than just record a fact. And wow. then the scrolls, um, 400 BC, this one's made out of uh, papyrus, and um, they could be 40 foot long, and uh, they were uh, used for several hundred years <clears throat> till the, and here is some papyrus here, which we right. still, uh, you still use it all. I mean, you still. Yeah, on, the, on a rare occasion, we had a client who um, <clears throat> went to Egypt. So we did a lot of tooling on the cover, you know, sort of different uh, hieroglyphics and everything. Right. And uh, this was the on the inside of the cover board. We lined it with papyrus. It's very brittle. Yeah. I mean, you could use it for a paper, but um, for a photo album, uh, maybe if it was a small one, it might be okay. But the one we were working on, we needed something bigger and uh, a bit more uniform. <clears throat> So the scrolls, <clears throat> 400 BC, <clears throat> and then um, 100 BC, we have the uh, Roman wax tablets, which are about this big on the average. It was a wooden frame, and it was filled with wax. And again, you take a stylus, and you could write into the wax, as well as when you were done, you could clean it off. You would scrape off the top. And, uh, and it came in two boards or sometimes three. And that was like the beginning of the idea of a book. Wow. Then we go over to uh, the bottom left and that's the earliest known codex. It's the Sinaiticus Bible and it's 350 AD. And you can see that it looks pretty darn close to wow. a modern book. Yeah. And wow. the, and this is a big technological advance over the scroll because you could access information in the middle of a very thick book very easily. As with a scroll, you had to scroll through it to get to that one uh, line that you were after. Mm. And, uh, and the scrolls are more now associated with um, the Jewish religion and the book with Christian. And so there was a, uh, a period where uh, they were both in use and the book, you know, became the, the the go-to choice for recording information. And right. uh, so that brings us up today. And the methods that they used to bind this book at 350 AD are pretty much exactly what I'm doing today. Somebody could walk in from that period and things would look different in some, in some of our equipment, but for the most part, they would fold, cut, and sew a book right. the way we do. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And uh, my... On a book, on on a handmade album, or the inside guts of the, do do, do you sometimes leave the decalage uh, showing as well? I do. Again, that is for uh, it's up to the client, <clears throat> and I always offer it because I think it's a great look. Yeah. But some of them want a very a they want it gilded, which means it has to be cut off and and, <clears throat> and uh, gilded in gold. Got it. Or yeah. Um, or they think, no, I'm, I want it to look uh, more clean, and um, uh, so let's cut that off because it's a thick album, and I want to be able to thumb through it more easily. Right, right. But right. there are definitely clients who, who yeah. like that look, and I do as well. <clears throat> now, you've also, Mark, we, we had a slide of of uh, some of the, um, yeah, right, okay. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'll walk through this one rather quickly. The top left is a desk accessory, which is a good part of our business. It's a box, a letter box that's made out of alligator. And to the right of that is a case where the top slips over the bottom and uh, they were to hold opera glasses and that's made out of red ostrich. Wow. Next to it is a little desktop uh, piece that holds an iPad and it has a little drawer next to it so they could have your notepads and coasters in there. 
Uh, to the right is another catch-all box uh, that's made out of curly lamb, you know, those coats that women used to wear in the 50s. Uh, well, I find them in uh, uh, secondhand shops and I cut them up and use them for bindings. And the bottom left was uh, to hold uh, an award. And this is one of those very involved projects where it has to work and it's not something I normally do. So it took a lot of trial and error. Uh, next to that is a, uh, is a uh, trunk. It was a uh, keepsake trunk a woman had me make for her, um, her children. How, so, how big is that? How big is that piece? Let's see. It's about this big, which would be about um, three feet by about uh, two feet. And structurally, I mean, it, it, it's what, what did you use as your as your structure? Your your oh. your. <clears throat> Fortunately, there's a fellow in town that uh, is willing to work with me. He kind of shakes his head <laughs> when I come by. It's like, all right, what am I making now? So <clears throat> he made the the case out of wood. And Got it. you can't see it, but the picture to the right bottom has a tray inside, which is also made out of wood, because my binders board is too flimsy to uh, mm -hmm. Mark, to can you move that can you move that slide up or you can't? Move it up to to so enlarge it. See that right then that right slide. Um you know the bottom right. Oh. Yeah, I can try to. Hold on one second. I just want to see what the inside looks like. Here we, here we go. So as you can see, we do a lot of uh, Is that better? Problem problems in leather. Uh, it's off screen, Mark. Oh, I don't see your screen. Sorry. Okay. But that took a lot of time and yeah. a lot of learning. And I haven't gotten another order. So, you know, so what's interesting, Paul, is it's not only it's not only book binding, but it's also somewhat packaging, exotic, you know, really decorative and and uh, and high-end packaging as well. Yeah. And yeah. if I could ask Mark after this to bring up the uh, the various bindings I've done. That's great. Or I could show you some while he's doing that. This is a slip case <laughs> to hold the book. And it's, it was on Coca-Cola from Aceline. And you could take the Coca-Cola bottle off. <laughs> wow. And uh, here's a little backgammon board completely made out of leather. Cool. And if I could have the clamshell, and this is a, a clamshell, which is a very popular solution to keeping a book or paperwork together. It can look like a book on the shelf. Right. And you open it up and it's double. It. And it protects it from the atmosphere, which is the biggest thing you want to do with books because that keeps them preserved. The, the, the oxygen is what causes the decay. Interesting. And, um, Oh yeah, and then little things like this, which are stacked boxes. And each one comes off. So cool. And then finally, you know, the desk accessory, but this is all different pieces of leather that we've set into the cover of this little catch-all box. Right. So it's fun because I'm, I'm bouncing back and forth between book restoration, taking old <laughs> books. Well, as I was saying, Paul, you gave the word bindery an entirely different, you know, meaning, you know. Well, one of the things I like about it is uh, that I can bounce back and forth between doing very traditional utilitarian bindings to something very creative, to doing something that's a restoration and get to have a book that's so rare that would never be. I'd never be able to see it or handle it. And I get to ha have it for a couple of weeks while I'm working on it. Right. Um, I've worked on a first folio Shakespeare. Oh, and these are uh, some um, of my celebrity clients. And let me just quickly say that <clears throat> all bookbinders have celebrity clients. So it's not such a big deal because I've, I've chatted with some of my bookbinding friends and said, I, you know, I just did a binding for so-and-so. And they said, yeah, I just got finished with one, too. <laughs> so uh, they use different binders very often. Some of them don't. But um, they all have, you know, have their own posse of <laughs> legs. 
I would I would imagine that you're working probably through a rep or through, you know, an intermediary. Uh, um, for the most part, yeah. yeah. Some of them are really, you know, I get to speak to them personally. Mm-hmm. But for the yeah. most part, you're dealing with somebody who uh, is their, you know, their assistant, which is fine by me. Well, Lauren, L- Lauren lives out on the East End, so, I, you know. Yeah. Though um, I've dealt with his wife. I really haven't dealt with him, but we've been binding books for his family uh, for over 25 years. I used to, some of these books that are up there, like those are big cases. He provides his own leather because uh, he wants a certain look. And really? then he pulled his children's drawings. And then you see the kids grow up and we've done their wedding albums. Uh, so I've kind of seen them grow up and we're still wow. doing things for them. Wow. And we have, uh, oh, in the top right, we have a space over in the Plaza Hotel, which is a lot of fun. Hope to get back there soon. And um, and it is just fun to 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 deal with people from a, a walk of life that is so foreign to me that um, you get to, on the occasion that you do get to meet them, uh, it is a bit of a perk for, for being a bookbinder. Oh, of course. Normally I'm in this bindery. Uh, you know, all the time. So just getting out and meeting anybody is a big deal. And, and some people <laughs> like you're, you're held captive in your studio. I know. <laughs> With my family and what my you- daughter, who's been helping me. And oh, and Abigail, my wife, also uh, she does helps out with the restorations. And she also we have uh, I don't have a picture of it, but she <clears throat> is a watercolor painter. And we've had many projects where they would want the church that they were married in, like the Dune Church in Southampton. Right. Thing of the Dune Church that would be set into the cover board with the date names on it. So everybody gets to contribute. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> Mark, how are we doing on time? Any we have questions for Paul or Yeah, we got lots of questions. I was just letting him go through the slides. So I just wanted to back up a little bit here. And uh, one question is, what advice can you give to people who want to break into this industry and how to get started? Um, Well, the way I did it was uh, just simply make a very long list of people who I thought might be able to use a book binding, whether they're stores or businesses or private, you know, people and um, I made hundreds of phone calls and uh, this is back back late 70s early 80s and I was lucky enough to get enough work to keep me in bookbinding and it slowly took traction but um, I I got a few good jobs in the beginning which allowed me to continue in the trade so I had a you know had a good start to it and it just built from there right Um, Hadley is now going through this experience and um, but on another track, she's more in the art world. So she's uh, doing artist books and she's uh, also has her own gallery now in the city. Oh, wow. So she wants to be in the art world as make as well as make art books, which is a whole nother thing, which is beyond me. Yeah. Jean has a question about um, uh, rebinding of old books, some of your restoration. Uh, any comments in, about approaches or procedures that you use in the rebinding of old books? Um, That's the most stressful of uh, the aspects of uh, bookbinding because you never know when it's going to go blow up in your face. For example, if you're working with a book from the 1800s and it's a light calf and you get too much moisture on it, it'll turn black and it doesn't go back. And uh, you might have this splotch of black on the cover. So uh, you, even if you have a set and you're working on them and everything's going well, you might get to the seventh in a set of 10 and things go very differently than the other six did. And that might be because the leathers were sourced from another area and they were tanned differently. So what worked in some don't work in the other. So you really have to be very careful. I tend to do it uh, when nobody's around because you're just so focused. You don't want the phone ringing or anybody right. talking to you. So I do it at night. Yeah. Mm, interesting. But Michael, it is great in that you get to see books that you normally wouldn't. All right. Michael, you mentioned earlier about a deckle edge. Is it, Paul, is it possible to apply gilding on the deckle edge or does it have to be a smooth? 
It has to be smooth because they um, they sand it and then they polish it with an agate and uh, to a mirror polish. Then they put on this <clears throat> coating, it's called a bowl. And then they lay the gold leaf on top of that and polish it into the bowl. Um, you couldn't do that if it was a rough surface. Well, if, if I guess if you wanted to, I mean, you could probably hand color <clears throat> the decalage. You know, on, you know. Yeah, no, Michael, absolutely. Yeah. So that would be now getting into the more creative yeah. aspects of it. So it would be a very untraditional um, gilding. Yeah. A very interesting one. That's a yeah. good idea. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Sarah has a question about the smallest book project you've ever done, the largest, and I guess it's a size, not uh, not the time, but the largest size and the smallest size book that you've ever worked on. Um, for a client, it really wasn't all that small. As a matter of fact, Hadley just sent me this. This is a little sewing frame with a book. Uh, and we can hear one sec, this one. This is an old, this is an old book, but I used to make these because they looked rather. Oh, it was very cool. Yeah. And yeah, it's a, a marble uh, fly leaf, yeah. And um, I made this for my wife when she, uh, when we first met. And, uh, but this would probably be as small as we get. I have made tinier ones, but that was just for myself. But for a client, they'd be about this small. That's about as small as they'd get. And the biggest have been um, oh, about four foot high. It's like an elephant folio. And uh, wow. they're problematic because two things. One is the materials act differently on a bigger scale. So you could pay something off on a small scale and be in control of it. But if it's, say, for example, a big sheet of paper and you're pasting it off, it does different things than it would on a smaller scale. And second, you would need to have equipment that could handle a book because some mm -hmm. of involve a press. And my press is about that wide and you'd need a press that wide. So you have to construct something. I have pictures of it, which I didn't send. I have to construct something. I go back to my carpenter friend, have boards made up, very thick boards. <clears throat> and then I put uh, carpenter's clamps on the sides. So that becomes a rather just involved project, getting the jig set up. To, uh, to put pressure on the, some of these books mm. while they're being made. All right. Uh, you know, just one little note, because I know you're new to the bamboo that I sent you the other day, Paul. Yeah, th that particular paper is very, very, um, uh, shall we say, covers a multitude of mediums. I mean, you can watercolor on it. You can pen and ink on it. You can draw on it. Um, it it's going to be interesting to see what you can do with it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to actually uh, trying it out for for all those different mediums. I want to try the uh, I do I do calligraphy, and I want to and with a pen, and uh, I want to see how that takes as well as uh, watercolor and colored. Yeah, paper. it should do, it should do well because it has sizing on it. Yeah, it should do well. <clears throat> Mark, do you have any other questions for Paul? Well, we're at, we're kind of out of time. There are a few more questions, but actually, you had prepared a one minute video. Do you want to show that as we close out the program? We can show that real quick, or do you want to? Can we do okay, that, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me. Um, you should. Everybody should start seeing this oh. on your screen. Okay. Sure. Paul, if I don't get a chance to say thank you, it's been um, Michael. Oh, here it is. Wow. Oh, and Michael, while this is going on, yeah. I'm going to do this last thing over here. I just tooled this on my pencil. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic, Paul. <laughs> that is fantastic.
Well, this hour went by pretty quickly. You know, we covered a lot of ground, Paul. I, and I have to tell you, I can't thank you enough. I'm really for, you know, for taking the time to do this with us. Well, I had a lot of fun, and I always love to talk about book binding. So it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you, Mark. 